Welcome to Whitetail Rendezvous, hosted by Bruce Hutchins. I'm so happy you've joined us today, and you're going to find out a lot about whitetail hunting on the show. This is Whitetail Rendezvous, episode number 373. Hey folks, we got a new sponsor. It's called Buckwild Coffee. What's so special about Buckwild Coffee? Well, a gazillion people go to Starbucks every day and drink coffee. Well, why shouldn't Buckwild Coffee offer you light, medium, or dark roast with free shipping? All you have to do is go to whitetailrendezvous.com, go to shop, and order your coffee, and I'll ship it out for free. Hey, thanks so much for visiting Buckwild Coffee. The best brew in the West, the best brew around the campfire, the best brew in the hunting shack, the best brew anywhere. Buckwild Coffee. Get yours today. Hey, folks, we're heading out to Nebraska today, and we're going to talk to Jason Obermiller and Eric Fitzgerald. Jason has a master's in biology, and Eric's got over 26 years as an agronomist for his own company. They both know what it takes to grow cattle and whitetails. And for the first time ever, I talked to a guy, they're going to talk about having control herd that they can watch and monitor so they can see the difference in everything else they do outside that control. So you have one herd that just lives off the land, no inducement of anything at all, no minerals, no special crops, no food plot, no anything different than what they just got in the natural. Then they have another herd that's all about how to grow a better herd. And the differences are intriguing. I learned a lot. So get a pencil and paper. You're going to enjoy these guys. It's never too early to think about food plots. Wait till Rendezvous has an ebook for you. Just simply text 33444 Food Plot and get your copy. Welcome to another episode of Whitetail Rendezvous. This is your host, and we're heading out to Loop City, Nebraska. What the heck is in Loop City, Nebraska? Well, Rackology lives there. Who's Rackology? Well, Eric Fitzgerald and Jason Obermiller are going to tell us all about Rackology today and a lot more about hunting big whitetails in Nebraska. Hey, guys. Welcome to the show. Thank you. Hey, Bruce. So um, let's start off with Eric. Eric, you've got a um, long history. Uh, you got a degree um, from universities in agronomy and an MBA from the University of Nebraska uh, Kearney. I mean, you've been a student of this industry for a long time. And tell me that role that that played into the formation of Rackology. Well, not not to get too long winded, but I've. I've always uh, had a place uh, for agriculture in my heart. I grew up in agriculture and uh, knowing that I wanted to pursue a career in there, I decided that I better try to to find out what degrees were available. And when I started college, I wasn't quite sure what an agronomist was or what agronomy was and uh, decided that uh, I'd get my prerequisites done and try to figure out what I was going to do and Lo and behold, uh, the university, you know, I guess backstep a little bit. We, um, you know, born and raised in rural, you know, Nebraska, you know, I knew my, all my, my family farmed and I knew what the, you know, the agronomist role played in, in my, uh, in my, both my grandfather's and my, and my cousin's farms. And so I always kind of knew that there was always somebody out there kind of helping my, my family out, knowing, you know, what's out there as far as insects, diseases, uh, when they should water, when they should hold off watering. Um, and so going to college, you know, finishing up, uh, my last two years, I did an internship with a, with a full-time agronomist in South central Nebraska. And after the first week, I knew I found my niche where I wanted to be. And, um, once I found that, it's like they say, when you go to college or you're doing anything um, and you don't know quite know what you want to do until it hits you. And that's when it hit me that summer working for him. I knew that's that was my place. And so um, later on, after I graduated, I knew I wanted to go after my MBA and um, and get some business background and finish that while I was working for that same agronomist and working for an agronomy lab during the winter time, And um, basically got the opportunity to move from Kearney, Nebraska up to Loop City and, uh, 
do agronomy and sell seed corn uh, for a company and decided I'd take that as a, you know, and then when I found out, you know, I guess the opportunity and how big the area was, I, I figured I'd better jump on the chance. So uh, I accept the position up here in Loop City, and it's hard to believe that's been almost 20 years ago already. But uh, so decided to branch out on my own in 2004, doing agronomy. And um, I guess the uh, I guess the, the timing and everything coming up here Loop City uh, led me to meet Jason here. I've loved to hunt and fish my whole life. And that's, I guess, one story of um, how I really um, came to like agronomy is when we were out to uh, goose hunt with a friend of mine and we had a guy pull up and he had a, um, we had a ragtag uh, decoys, uh, uh, Canadian de- geese decoys. And we had some silhouettes and stuff that we handmade just because we didn't have enough money to go buy a bunch of decoys. We, uh, had them out and another gentleman pulled up a little later than we did. And we, uh, uh, started talking to him and figured, well, one set is better than two sets. You know, we'll just hunt together. And he had a brand new truck and trailer and all these Bigfoot decoys. And when he, uh, finally, you know, we were sitting there, um, in between the flocks of geese coming in, we were talking and I asked him what he did. And he said he was an agronomist and, and, then that's, he goes, I, I really like to work really hard during the summertime, get my soil sampling done in the early fall. He goes, I got all winter to hunt and, and do whatever I wanted to do. And that kind of stuck in my mind as like that, that's kind of the itinerary I kind of want for my life. And so, um, with both of those, I, I just fell in love with agronomy and, and, uh, moved up to Loop City here and did a ground work here since 2001 and started my business in 2004 actually and met jason probably shortly after probably in 2003 2004 and uh took a deer into him uh he's also a taxidermist here and uh we kind of hit it off then and and then uh, we've been friends ever since and when we started talking about this jason brought this to me and i guess we can get into this when we talk about rackology baby he brought what he kind of wanted for um to feed his deer and i told him i could kind of help him out with that and that's when it kind of started good for you and you know um we, we all get to a place i like to call it a place called there and it's a sometimes it's not a direct route that's for sure but we always i i feel we always end up where we should be and life seems to go a little bit better when we when we do that. Hey, Jason, you're up. Um, what's kind of your background, and 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 tell a few stories about how you got to where you are. Well, uh, some of the stories can be a little interesting, <laughs> but you know, I uh, I started off uh, going to college uh, right out of high school, obviously, and I you know was originally going into wildlife wildlife management and you know, after about two years, I just, I really didn't know what the heck I wanted to do. So I actually, you know, dropped out of, out of college. Um, and while I thought my story was going to kind of end there and I was just going to keep kind of doing a somewhat normal job, I was doing construction afterwards for a while. I, uh, you know, me, me and my granddad, he is kind of a huge male mentor in my life. He was kind of that, that person for me. Uh, he was a, he was a pastor. And, uh, so he had, he had time when, you know, I'd growing up. I mean, I'd, I always, we went everywhere hunting together and trips and you name it. And so I was kind of consulting with him cause I was pretty bummed. I'm like, what the heck, you know, should I do for a living? I'm tired of doing construction work. And he's the one that kind of hit me towards uh, the taxidermy, uh, uh, avenue and so I went to taxidermy school and uh, I've been doing that now for over 20 some years I'm not sure exactly how long but over 20 years professionally um, and then still I just kind of felt like there was still a void there I just wasn't I didn't feel like I was getting through to people or helping people like what I grew up watching him do as a pastor and so I uh, kind of have actually kind of went through a little bit of a midlife crisis so to speak and <laughs> my wife were standing in the middle of the yellow diet aisle and her burgers when 
I kind of was like, you know, I just don't know. I love doing taxidermy. I like what I'm doing, but I don't feel fulfilled. And she's like, well, why don't you be a teacher? And at the time, I thought she was crazy because, you know, I'm like, I'm just, you know, kids just don't really do it for me. And and she said, well, go back to doing your biology thing. Get your degree for biology. Get a teaching degree. Try teaching one year. If you don't like teaching, quit and go get lost in the woods. I'm like, you know what? That, that sounds like a plan because teaching is something where I could make an impact, uh, you know, on, on people and actually help people kind of like what I grew up uh, witnessing. And so I uh, did that. And it was really tough going back, you know, after being off for like, I don't know, six, seven years. And so that was, that was kind of crazy going back. But, um, you know, I've been teaching now for what, 13, 14 years. And a number of years ago, I went back for my master's. Uh, so needless to say, I, I fell in love with teaching, just making the impact on the kids and, and being able to help them and their families was just, it was, it was, it's just an awesome experience. And, uh, you know, I pretty much thought that was it for me. That that's what my, what, you know, my calling was or is, and it continues to be. But in the meantime, I decided to uh, further my education. So I had a, I got a, ba- uh, a bachelor's in, uh, biology and a bachelor's in health and a bachelor's in, uh, in, um, education. Uh, but then I went on to get my master's in biology and, and actually did my research, uh, project for that on, uh, deer antler growth, uh, and, uh, kind of adjunct to that also, uh, deer herd health, like nutrition. So I really dove deep into the, uh, not only just the antler growth, you know, but the deer nutrition side of the thing, because growing up in a rural community, you know, I grew up around Loop City uh, most of my life and, uh, you know, grew up ranching and farming with, with, uh, with my stepdad and, and just kind of watching him, what he did. And, you know, we ran between four and 500 head of cattle and farmed quite a few acres. So I, I grew up ranching and farming and, um, you know, we worry a lot about our deer health or our cattle health and stuff, but you know, just there wasn't a whole lot of, you know, realistic deer health out there. And so when I was when I was doing my research, getting my master's, you know, I really expanded uh, deep into this. And the more I researched, the more I realized that it got really complicated. It's, you know, a lot of stuff on the market I found was, um, you know, it was basically somebody took a cattle product like a vitamin mineral or something and slapped a deer sticker on it and said, here's the next best thing for deer. And you advertise enough and, you know, people are going to buy it no matter what. And, you know, so I did my research, which we'll talk about, you know, the whole rackology piece later on, but that's, you know, that's kind of like my education there with the master's in biology now and continue to, you know, obviously research since that day uh, on, you know, some of these various topics that interest me. So that's kind of my educational background and, Always been a lifelong outdoorsman. Uh, my granddad started me hunting when I was, I think I was five or six when I started uh, going with him and actually I was using a 410, uh, shooting grouse and pheasants and stuff with him and, you know, just uh, fell in love with the outdoors and, you know, it just, I've been blessed to be able to grow up and, and do all those things and uh, just basically hunting and fishing my whole life. Uh, in fact, I suppose sometimes most, uh, you know, the, the trouble I got in a lot of times at home was because I was out too late, you know, coon hunting or, uh, I had chores to do at home, but, uh, decided to head to the deer stand instead. And so that's, uh, you know, I go on with the hunting stories like that, which maybe we'll do some of those later, but that's kind of my, my background as to how I got to where we are right now. And, and like Eric said, in the meantime, when I, you know, when I came up with what I was looking for formulating wise, you know, I went to him, but, uh, you know, we'll get into that here when you're ready for it. Hey, thanks for the background because it is important, um, to all my listeners. My tell Rodham is all about real people and real places. And, and I just enjoy traveling, you know, into Canada, throughout the the whole uh, United States, um, and, and talking to guys just like you that, you know, um, work hard, you know, have a have 
have a moral compass uh, set uh, and, and bring in their family and also um, through it all find time enough to, you know, go chase critters uh, of whatever size. And, and that's one thing, you know, um, that's great about where we live. Uh, and, you know, having said that, it's a, it's a joy to have you two guys on the show and, and, and spending a, a few minutes together. Okay, here here's the million dollar question: Double helix drop time. Now, come on, guys, what is that all about? Well, kind of a, <laughs> you know, that's unique. <laughs> I gotta, I I gotta tell you guys, I read that and I went double helix. Okay, DNA, genetic. Okay, I get all that, but I, that's that's unique. You have a unique logo that's nobody going to copy. Yeah, it was one of those things where you know we'd. Uh, you know, uh, when I when I came to Eric with kind of the formulation that I was wanting that I, I just couldn't find anywhere else, I said, you know, we, uh, we need to get this stuff mixed for me because I've been mixing in a bucket for, you know, a couple of years and so uh, end up starting to get it mixed up. Well, when, when we had enough people started, you know, getting interested, in fact, I'd had finally had a ton made and sitting here and using it and one time Eric called and said, uh, just to let you know, we're out. And I was, I was kind of like, um, well, that stuff's for us. So I'm not sure why we're, what, what are we out of? And he said, well, I sold it. And at first I was like, that's not cool because I came up with this idea and was like, uh, you know, I, I really didn't want anybody. I didn't want to, uh, put it out there. Uh, you know, we came about this totally honestly through research and it had no, no monetary interest period. And so get another ton made and uh, kind of a long story short, same thing happens again. And, you know, we both kind of looked at each other and I don't remember Eric's exact words, but it was like, I think, I think you need to think about doing something with this. And, uh, as we started to kind of, you know, plan a little bit, cause I, I really was still dragging my feet at first. Cause I just, I knew what I knew what I'd came up with. Um, I knew what else was out there because I researched. Because, frankly, when I came up with the the stuff that I wanted in it and the, the the ratios and all the complicated stuff that I can explain later if you want me to, it just wasn't it wasn't there. Number one, it wasn't there all in one bag. I mean, you had to buy two, three, four different products to get that. And so, my my concern was, you know, my whole thing with my study was when you, if you have healthy deer. Everything else, including antlers, is just going to be a, a, a bonus, a byproduct, because you, you, you ultimately you have to get, you have to uh, maximize a deer's genetic potential. And so, you know, that's something I think that I just keep, kept saying and saying. And, and Eric, uh, the in fact, someday we'll have to post it. We got the original drawing that Eric made, I don't know, what was that, a couple of three, four years ago. Uh, four years ago set waiting for my daughter to get done with the dance practice in North Loop, Nebraska. And I was in the picket, kind of waiting, and uh, started drawing a few things up. And I drew up uh, kind of a double helic, uh, helical drop tine on the single side and uh, not on the double side. And I sent it to Jason and said, well, what do you think about this? And uh, he's, he's kept that picture ever since. <laughs> and uh, that's where it kind of started. I was kind of a, you know, they, Jason and Christy, kind of talked about the helical trying to maybe try to figure out you know dna because we're you know we want that you know knowing that the dna is a big part of the deer's uh, makeup that you know health is the other part and so i just took that that helical logo look and uh thought well what is you know and i kept seeing you know be kind of cool to have a drop time and then turn that drop time kind of morphed into a helical and uh, texted it off to Jason and that's, that's where it kind of was a, it's an inception and we decided to do it on both sides. Yeah. Well, kind of the reason why we end up with on both sides is I'm, you know, when you, when you get to get to know me, I've, I've got my own bucket of issues and one of them, I'm a little bit OCD. And so <laughs> it was kind of like having training wheels, but just one on one side, right? It just don't fly. And so <laughs> When he texted me that picture, I'm like, that is cool, but we got to have it on both sides. So, you know, go ahead and, you know, see if you can figure that out. Well, it wasn't later. He had another picture that he'd sent and, 
And so that's kind of how the double helix came, number one, and how it became on both sides was, you know, and what's cool is just everything we've done and, and, and everything we do, you know, not only does it go back to a passion for what we, what we like doing, but it's, it's cool to work with somebody that, um, is like-minded like I am. I mean, we're, we're, we think a lot alike. Uh, we're very good at giving each other corrective criticism and taking it and just working together where, you know, you know, a lot of times people get, you know, upset because somebody didn't like an idea or somebody didn't like that. And, you know, Eric is, you know, if, if I had to say who is probably the most, um, I don't know if easy going is the word, but he's, uh, he's, he's kind of my sounding board and I can, he can give me ideas and I can, give him ideas and we can both say, yep, I like it or no, I don't. And we don't have to worry if the other one's going to be upset about whether we liked it or not. We can, you know, we just, you know, mesh real well with, with, with that. But that's how that, uh, the double helix, you know, coming from DNA came about was I wanted to get back to what, you know, ultimately we were, uh, researching and concerned with in the first place. And that is maximizing a deer's genetic potential because it goes well beyond bucks. I mean, it goes to the does, it goes to the fawns, it goes to four years down the road, your deer, right? Starting them off uh, healthy through conception during mating season and healthy through gestation, which, you know, ultimately is going to lead to a, a much healthier adult uh, deer. So that's that on the, the uh, helix. Well, and, and thank you for that, because listeners, um, yes, it's all about DNA, and, and, and the building blocks of everything in our body comes from that DNA. That's, that's the formula. But if you don't have the right nutrition and protein environment, all if you've got bad water, you're going to die. If you don't have oxygen, you're going to die. Well, if you don't have good fuel in your body, you're going to die. That's you and me as humans. Now, deer are no different. And so... You know, when I when I kind of dug into this and, and got a hold of Jason and, and understood what he's doing, it's it's about growing your deer to the best genetic pool that you have. And you know, guys, take it from there because that's my thought. Now, correct me, throw me in the lake, or let's go down the road together in the pickup. Yeah, I mean, you know, if. Um... When, when I was, you know, getting kind of back to the research, uh, you know, what I basically did is, you know, I went back to every nutrient, you know, every vitamin, every mineral. And I wanted to know, cause growing up, you know, ranching, you know, obviously we supplemented our cattle, um, you know, every, every agricultural industry with, with livestock, you know, does some sort of supplemental feeding, whether it's chickens or beef. And so I knew what cattle needed. Uh, but at the same time, I also knew that deer needed a little bit different. And, uh, you know, I've consulted with nutritionists before and, and a lot of them are on the agricultural side and, and, you know, kind of use them as a sounding board also for what I was finding in my research. <clears throat> but the, you know, it gets pretty crazy when you get really into the, into the nitty gritty of it where, you know, there are certain minerals that have got to be with another mineral or they won't be absorbed uh, as efficiently or at all sometimes. Uh, and then, and so there's a number of them that have that, you know, issue that they have to have a, a complementary mineral. Uh, then you can go a little bit further and, and you find out that uh, now that you get these two complementary uh, minerals together at the right ratios, uh, there also has to be another mineral or a certain vitamin that has to be available for those two to even be absorbed and utilized efficiently. And then, you know, you take it even a step further and there's catalyst vitamins and minerals that, that aid in the secondary, uh, you know, helper nutrients, so to speak. And so it, it just, it turns into this long chain of, well, you got to have this, but then this has to be here for that. And that has to be there for that to even be there. And it gets, it really gets complicated. And I think a lot of times, you know, it's easy to get lost in the research and just go heck with it. Let's just use whatever's out there and whatever. And so that, that's not me. Obviously I'm the type of person that when I, when I, when I go after something or when I do something, I'm, I'm a hundred percent or nothing. And I, and I always complete my mission, so to speak. And so that's kind of the direction I took it. And when I was done, I, 
which I've never done. I'm always researching, but you know, I, I just looked into everything and some, uh, some companies had, you know, some good minerals and vitamins. Uh, they weren't chelated like ours and some of them that were chelated, uh, the formulation, the ratios weren't exactly what I wanted. Um, they usually never had protein with them. So, you know, it boils down to, you have to go, you know, I'd have to go buy protein. I'd have to go buy the vitamins, have to go buy the vent minerals. I'd have to go buy an attractant. And so you got three or four different things that you got to put together and, you know, spending 60, 80 bucks on a little pile of stuff that you put out. And in fact, the one commercial we ran on the Pursuit channel that's on our website basically signifies that it's got me walking in with one bag and Eric walking with three or four things in his arm, which he's the big guy. He's, and he's quite a bit bigger than I am. It reminds me a lot of that movie, uh, twins you know with uh, arnold schwarzenegger and danny devito i'm danny by the way <laughs> and and so you know when it when it all boiled down to it i wanted everything in one bag i don't know why i just always felt like why is it so complicated why can't i just find what i want and when i couldn't that's when i decided to start making it myself and i just kind of kept it my own little secret until you know people i made the mistake of showing game camera pictures of does in july that you know, like every good science person, you got to have a control group. And for those of you that know, don't know what a control is, uh, it's an area that you leave in its most natural state. You don't alter it. So on that area, I wasn't supplementing. I wasn't giving them anything on my uh, rackology sites. That's what I was putting out. And the thing I noticed first that impressed me the most was my does in July, you know, you you couldn't see the ribs like on my control group. You could see the ribs. They looked milked out. You know, the fawns looked okay. I mean, it just looked like normal, like we're used to seeing. Um, the deer on the rackology was, you know, they looked like they weren't even carrying fawns. The fawns looked sleek. And these are, these are critters that were conceived. These fawns were conceived on rackology. And now looking back over the years, some of these fawns that we followed up, through the ranks that have, you know, survived, um, you know, they're just, they are far above health wise from our deer that didn't get any of this. And we've got a lot of agriculture around here. I mean, you know, I've got them going, you know, game cameras, pictures of them going to the pile and there's a cornfield in the background and an alfalfa field next to that and a bean field right across. And so they're not lacking for food, uh, but deer are not stupid. They, their body tells them they sense what they need. And, you know, all these, you know, everything that's in that bag, the protein, the vitamins, the minerals, you know, all the nutrients, the attractant deer know when they're satisfied and they leave it. They're not going to sit there and eat you out of house and home. Like, you know, the biggest thing that we get is talking to people on the phone and they're like, well, you know, something about your protein or it's just protein. It's no, it's, not just protein and it's it's hard maybe to wrap a person's mind around it because it's it's not something that's been that popular to do evidently but it's putting everything in one bag now you know we've got our straight you know vitamin and mineral concentrates so you can make your mineral licks and so forth but it's just kind of the direction i wanted to go is have everything already pre-thought out so you know now a person doesn't have to go through the guesswork of what should i put out here and how much of this should i put in it and you know, I got a number of years of research that goes into that. So it's, I guess that's kind of how that, uh, you know, that came about. And then me and him have been researching like crazy since then. And have got our own, you know, coming out with our food plot mixes and our, our, uh, vitamin and mineral concentrate. We got our food plot fertilizer, which if you want me to expand on, have Eric expand on, on a little bit more, but, uh, in essence, it's not your normal NPK. Uh, this takes your normal fertilizer and and uh, adds as many of the vitamins and minerals, as many of the nutrients as humanly possible, and putting them in a plant, which has not been, been available in the food plot industry until now. It's just been your normal fertilizer, which uh, it all started with a uh, guy in Illinois kind of asking us about, you know, we can't we can't even supplement here, he said. It's illegal, and as a guide, I can't do it and risk my guide business. He says, but if you can put everything in one bag, into one plant, he says, I'll be interested. And that's when uh, we'd already kind of been, you know, looking into it, but 
that's kind of when I put the pressure on Eric and said, hey, agronomist, uh, let's let's make this product. And he got it done. And so it's, you know, the problem is, is these nutrients just don't pass through the cell naturally the way uh, they do when, when you use this fertilizer so that you can get as much of that into the plant, which then the deer can take up. And so, you know, if you want him to expand more on that, I'd be more than happy to hand it over to Eric. Um, there was a word that you used, and it was about five minutes ago, saying what was in it, and I, I should have wrote wrote it down, but um, we need to explain it. And um, it's not- the, the key chelation. Yeah, chelation. Thank you. Uh, what what chelated is is so most of you know most products uh, you know agricultural involved is they're. They're just your normal vitamins and minerals. Uh, they're they're in their uh, they're in a little bit more complex form, and so when you chelate it, uh, in essence, what you're doing is you're taking that nutrient. Whether you know, no matter what mineral it is, no matter what it is, you're taking that nutrient, and you're putting it in the most absorbable form uh, for absorption in the digestive system of that animal. Just like if you go to the store, and I'm not going to mention any vitamins or nothing, but you know certain vitamins that you go to the store and buy, you can take them all you want, and you're going to pass them through your system. Uh, the ones that are a little more expensive, more expensive, uh, they're chelated. You're going to absorb a higher concentration of those nutrients, and you're going to get more out of it. You're going to get more bang for your buck, so to speak. And so, you know, when you these nutrients being chelated, it just means that they're as simply, there's in the most simplest, most broke down form ready for absorption. And uh, it's just, it's, it's far better for your critters and you don't have to use as much of it as you would something else. In fact, um, you know, some, some, some studies that I've read have, uh, you know, stated that, um, you know, chelation can, can aid in absorption by up to, you know, five to seven percent, or excuse me, five to seven times more absorbable than in their raw form. And if you think about that, if you make something five to seven times more absorbable, uh, that means you can use less and the deer utilize it better. And then, you know, we have another additive that we also put in there that increases absorption even by another 30 percent helps with the bad microbes that they can pick up in the soil, it helps their good microbes that are naturally in their gut, aids in digestion and, and health, and, you know, it also prevents them from, you know, any other issues that they may encounter in nature, like foundering around here. You know, if a deer gets into a farmer's corn pile, they can do just like cattle and founder, and, you know, this other additive uh, helps prevent that also. So, you know, we're never done researching. We're always, you know, as, as perfect as we feel we have it, uh, we're never we're never satisfied, so to speak. So that's just that's just kind of how we are. But that's the that's kind of the just a key. Whitetail Rondo is pleased to announce a partnership with GoHunt.com. Who's GoHunt.com? Well, if you're a DIY hunter, you need the information at GoHunt.com forward slash insider. Why? Because it provides 4,200 profiles, every unit, every species, and every season. Furthermore, they give in-depth analysis, interactive maps, unit access, and seasonal trends. Draws are very important, and they give you the most accurate information in the business. All this is available when you go to GoHunt.com forward slash Insider. Make sure you use promo code WR when you join Insider. You'll get a $50 gift card for GoHunt.com gear shop. All in all, if you're hunting out west in 2018, GoHunt.com Insider is where you need to be to get all the research information. When you use promo code WR, Whitetail Rendezvous receives a small commission from GoHunt.com. Yeah, I feel um, I'm in class, uh, not one-on-one either. I'm kind of like, um, okay, you know, I'm, I'm getting a lot of um, scientific, you know, reasoning. And folks, the big box stores have product and they have fillers and they have coating and have all these things and studies have been done and you can go and you can pay full price for maybe I'm going to be kind 60% of product. 
everything else is worthless. That's just a fact because they don't, you know, uh, if you're selling tons and tons, metric tons and throughout the, the country and everybody knows about food plots, everybody has to have seed, everybody has to have this and that, but you have to understand the product that you put on the ground to understand how it's going to affect your deer. It's going to help them. It's not going to do anything. And if it doesn't do anything, you're taking a hundred dollar bills and just kind of burning them up. And if I make some people mad about this, well, send me an email, whitetailrendezvous at gmail.com. Because we really need to understand this business. It's a billion dollar business, folks. Your part, if you're plant one seed and one micro plot, if you're spraying this, if you got this, if you got that, and I've got a lot of friends in the industry and their products work. But the thing is, the more we understand why our product's working, why that product works, and how we can grow big deer from the and and Jason said it from the time and in inception it's bred that fetus that that um embryo needs the best chance in the world to grow up to be a, a breeding doe or Mr. Wonderful that everybody like to have on his wall and so that's why you know I'm I'm excited to have these guys on cuz this isn't you know this isn't you know go buy a bag of seed and we're going to do it. This is what's behind the scenes. And I want you, each one of you to understand what's behind the scenes and saying that if, if somebody wants to reach out to you guys, what's the best way? Well, uh, the, our website obviously is www.rakology.org. That'd be R-A-C-K-O-L-O-G-Y.org. And we're on uh, Rackology LLC on Instagram, uh, Rackology on Facebook, and Rackology on Twitter. So we're about as many places you can be social media-wise, and that will get us connected to us. And then also, you know, we can get on the website and find our email, which is rackologyllc at gmail.com, and uh, send us emails or inquiries or questions as well. So, so we, we got healthy deer. And so what does that mean to your hunting? What you said, you got control group and then you've got your rack allergy, rack allergy group. Um, what herd do you hunt? Well, um, to be honest with you, I mean, I hunt, we, we hunt both. Uh, I don't, you know, uh, hunting wise, I'm, and this gets back to kind of me being OCD and, anal or whatever you want to call it. I don't know if that's the right word for it or not, but I, uh, I don't like to over hunt a stand. I don't like to over hunt a spot. Um, I don't like to go in when the wind's not right. Uh, you know, I'll wait weeks to hunt a spot until the, the conditions are right. And so, you know, there's a lot to be said about, um, you know, success wise, sometimes people have great, they might, you know, just by default have great genetics and great deer on their property. Um, but they don't seem to harvest, you know, or have, you know, problem even seeing these deer and, um, not that we have giants on our place uh, by no means, but, um, success comes more from, uh, playing your cards right and knowing what stands to hunt, uh, the white, right wind to hunt it. Scent control is huge. I mean, I know there's a lot of, there's a lot of stuff on the market that, that works and there's a lot of stuff on the market that doesn't work with scent control. Um, you know, it's something you kind of have to experiment with and find out on your, you know, on your own. Cause I mean, everybody's body chemistry reacts with those products differently, but you know, ultimately it, it just boils down to common sense hunting and not over hunting a spot. And so I, we hunt, we hunt both of our, you know, both of our spots and, and, uh, you know, don't want to, don't want to overdo it in an area. When you think of uh, age class recruitment, you know, from year to year, is your control um, less? I would think it'd be less than the rack algae group, or are they similar, but the deer are just smaller and don't, um, you know, they don't fulfill the potential? Well, I mean, your, your, your harvest weights, and this again, you get, if, if you're going to, you got to compare apples to apples, and that's the biggest thing I run into. You know, the, the public, and it's, it's nothing against them, uh, and literally what we're running into is we have to re-educate the public on, you know, our product, on why and so forth, and same with just deer biology in general. 
you know, uh, if you're going to compare the weight of a deer, um, you can't compare a five and a half year old to a two and a half or a three and a half year old. You know, you got to compare apples to apples. Uh, you got to compare, you know, what do they got to eat around the spot? You know, if my control group was clear out in the hills where they had nothing but grass to eat, uh, that would be an unfair advantage to, you know, that would be skewing the data or cooking the data, as we say in the science community. Um, so both of my spots I've chosen, my control and our rackology area, they both have uh, the same type of crop fields around them. Um, I, you know, we do notice, uh, um, you know, better body condition, uh, better body weight, you know, healthy they seem, uh, you know, a lot of a lot of research is subjective. Also, there's not always numbers involved in research. Um, when we look at our fawns, how well they look throughout the summer months and our does. And to me, I I really focus. Just you know, you you talk to anybody in the cattle industry, they don't always. It's not that you just focus on the health of your bulls. You're looking at the health of your cattle, right? And so your cows. And so we're looking at the health of our does and our fawns and seeing. You know, what do they look like all summer, all fall, all winter, you know, back into spring and, and so on. Uh, it's not that we can go out there and check their weaning weight like you can do with cattle, you know, but uh, we definitely notice a difference in their body condition, um, you know, and as, and as a, I guess, a byproduct, so to speak, of our product, uh, the bucks just happen to benefit uh, well, too. In fact, you know, the only way you could really, you know, everybody, you know, a lot of products in the market say, hey, we're going to grow, we can grow giant deer for you. Well, um, truth be told about the only thing anybody can guarantee is we can maximize your deer's genetic potential. But if your buck has only got the, you know, the, the genes to produce and, and max out at a 150, we, we can't pull a 180 out of our hind end for you. Uh, but, you know, that goes into genetic, you know, if you want to start managing your herd towards those bigger deer, um, obviously, you got to start letting the ones that have the genetics survive long enough to get those genes into your herd. The first time you see a big buck on your property and you whack it, um, you know, did he grow up there? Was he already spreading the genes? I mean, it, it gets pretty deep if you really want to get into deer management. But uh, overall, though, I mean, we definitely see a, uh, a, a difference in our herd health and fawns and antler growth and, and everything else. And one thing I'd like to add in here as far as the control versus, you know, the recology um, groups and you are going to see kids like in a candy store. It's Jason and I coming back with our cards from our uh, trail cameras. Sometimes I get more of a kick out of catching a deer on a trail camera. Almost is seeing one on the hoof. Um, nothing beats a feeling of actually getting a down animal that you've been, you've been patiently waiting for and, and trying to, uh, you know, trying to harvest, but, bringing those, those SD cards back, putting them in the computer or being out there with a handheld and, and seeing what you've got. Sometimes that control versus rackology, that's, that's, I mean, it gets really interesting for us because we can catalog the does and we can catalog the bucks. We can start, you know, you know, we, we age deer every time we get uh, a consistent picture of a, of a consistent buck, we age those and, and it, it and to me, going into both areas, it, it's just coming and you just kind of that anxiety you got, what you got, you know, holding in your hand with that SD card. What are you gonna see when you get back? And sometimes it's a dud. You know, you don't see too many big bucks or a lot of movement. Sometimes uh, uh, you'll have six thousand pictures on a trail camera, and over half of them are um, are, are herd photos. And being able to pick out you know, uh, what your product is doing for those. And uh, pictures can tell a thousand words. And that's why trail cameras are as important in our business as soil sampling is on the fertility side, I think. So um, not just seeing them in the hoof, but getting, catching them and, and knowing their their travel corridors and and where to, you know, um, uh, where to catch those deer and pattern them is, is huge. And, and that's just as exciting as, 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 I guess, harvesting one sometimes. Especially when you've put all the work into and and knowing the science behind it and knowing what you're trying to accomplish, um, and that's like what Jason said, we're trying to reeducate the public on what could what could benefit that 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 buck of their dreams and moments of if its conception and 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 hopefully keeping that doe healthy through the lactation uh, 
time frame, get good, healthy milk to that, that, that young buck or that young doe. And, and, uh, one of the neatest pictures we've got is, um, a doe eating from a feeder, eating our rackology while a fawn is suckling right behind her. It shows that, uh, full circle, I guess, of what happens out there. So. Yeah, it does. And in the warm up, we talked about, um, hard work and sometimes people look at, um, guys like you and, you know, people are buying your product and they look at people on TV and go, gee, I, I'd like to be, you know, I'd like to be there. So let's, let's address the hard work that, um, listeners need to understand what goes into developing any kind of product and, um, share some of your thoughts on that. And then, um, then we'll, uh, wrap the show up with some shout outs. All right. Well, getting into this, like Jason said, we came into this, honestly, uh, having a product that he wanted and he was like, we always say he was kind of like a mad scientist over his pot kettle of brew, you know, he didn't want to share it. He didn't want to share it. And I, I, I knew it was a good product and I was hoping he wasn't getting upset with me when I was selling it. But when the light bulb went off for both of us, when I said, you know, you, you, you've got something here. Um, and the hard work, you know, getting into the outdoor industry, there's a lot of misconceptions that people are getting paid to hunt. People are getting paid to, you know, uh, that it's easy. Uh, what do I need to do to do this? How can I get to where this person's at? Um, product wise, it's, it's a long, hard road. And we've been doing this for almost over four years. And, you know, I hate to say that, you know, there's a lot of times you're in the red and, uh, you just got to keep hope and, and educate and, and get out there and, and, and talk with people and let them know about your product and, and how, uh, not that our product is better than one other or how to, you know, but how, what separates us from what's out there right now. Um, just the logistics alone, you know, I always tell somebody, if you, if you come up with a, a, um, a product that's tangible that you could put on the end of an arrow or, or maybe it's the arrow itself, or maybe it's, um, uh, maybe it's, um, you know, bowstrings or a different type of ammunition. I mean, when it's tangible and people could see it, it's a little, I might get a lot of people that get mad at me for this, but it's a little easier to sell in a way when you've got a feed product that you don't see. I mean, you dump it on the ground and you, and you hope it gets uh, taken up by your deer and you hope produces, uh, produces results. And there's a lot of things on the market, like we talked about before that are on the shelves that are full of fillers that, you know, a lot of it, a number one is salt and yeah, deer will come to salt and they'll, they'll lick it up and, and, uh, but it's not, I mean, it's not doing them any, any health favors. It's just basically getting them in front of your trail camera or getting them in front of your hunting stand, depending on what state you're in. So, you know, there's a lot of stuff on the market around the shelves that you got to compete with. And when you get into a feed, um, it's, it's even tougher in my opinion, but knowing we've got a product and knowing the research behind it and Jason's, I mean, when it comes to hard work, Jason has done the framework for, uh, almost 15 years now of, uh, when he got his master's. And, and that's a lot of the hard work. And then the hard work comes now is to trying to prove to people with, with trail cam pictures with, um, we do a lot of, uh, a lot of shed studies. Um, and we've got documented sheds for, you know, some deer up to seven, eight years. And so I guess to get in the outdoor market is, is, is a, is a tough world. It's a growing world, which is awesome. I mean, I, I love to see, new people get exposed to the hunting world and what's available in the outdoor, especially if they've had no upbringing in it. It's just neat to see youth and, and, uh, people that are even older that are finally getting into hunting that that light bulb goes off in their head. Like, Hey, I like this. And that's what we like to be a part of with this product is, is getting it to people and to help, help them either manage their herd, help their hunting success. Um, and, uh, I guess looking back on it now, selling the first couple tons out from Jason in a way, uh, then I'm like, well, what have we done now? And now it's, uh, it's going to be a lot of work, but every time we do something and I look at it, it just, it, you know, it's a time when I was sitting there thinking what I want to, what I, what I want to do. And I wanted to do agronomy. I want to be in agriculture. And this is another one of those things where uh, I just, it occurred to me that, this is where we need to be. And, and, uh, I love doing it and I don't care how hard the work is. 
it all pays off in the end. And, and, uh, um, I guess that's my take on it. And I, and I forgive you for selling those. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. okay. Stop. Stop. Stop the presses right now. Okay. Why did people buy it? Okay. You sold it. But one, how did they find out about it and why did they buy it? Well, um, I guess Jason's always had a network of hunting friends with his taxidermy shop. Um, I'll let him get into that, but, um, I own a, a shop right on the highway in Loop City, and Loop City is the only town of 900 people. So, you know, it, it's a pretty small community, tight knit. Um, got a but, country club. And it's yes, got a it, it, yes, it does. It has it has the it's Loop City golf this. course. Yes, it's got an awesome <laughs> reservoir. Uh, great habitat around there, it, and that lake is a huge <laughs> part of our community. Um, uh, I hate to say it though, but I've I've lived here since 2000 and uh, 2000. Um, a little before 2000, I guess 99 when I moved up here and I've been on the lake four times. <laughs> so, uh, I guess we do a lot of hard work, but it is enjoyable when you get out there. But, um, but yeah, it's, it's a small town and we, uh, I own a business right on the highway and people come in and, and they, you know, I guess how I sold a couple of the guys, you know, well, talking to them, either, either playing basketball or if our kids have something together. Yes. And I, I think I mentioned a, a few of them. I'm like, yeah, you should check out this product Jason has because they were either buying it something else or just mixing their own stuff. And they're like, you can just get that just in the bag and dump it out. And I'm like, well, yeah, it's, it's, and then knowing, and them guys knowing Jason and how, how focused he is on what he wants and knows it's just not a bunch of stuff in a bag. It's, they're like, oh, if Jason's using it, then I'm going to try it. And, um, so they'd come into the shop and, one guy'd buy five bags. He'd tell his friend they'd have pretty good luck getting stuff in front of cameras, and and then um, all of a sudden his friend would come in, and then uh, before you know it, a ton is only forty bags, and before you know it, a ton sounds like a ton. Forty bags doesn't sound like that lot, but um, before we knew it, it was gone, and I had to call and tell Jason. I'm like, oh well, I'm hoping this is all right, but it's gone because he I knew he was gonna come in and get some, and and um, so you that's how it, it, you didn't give it away. You sold it, right? I sold it. Yeah, I sold it. Yeah, well, we didn't make some money. Yeah, <laughs> I, I made Jason some money, and and uh, we we kind of actually that first Jason's else let's go ahead and get another ton, and and so we did. Now with his taxidermy shop, he had the kind of the same thing happen with guys coming in and ask him, and I don't think he was as, as he was a little more reluctant to to let people know about it right away, but once it started kind of getting around that that. Uh, was kind of the real deal that um that it started kind of moving out of our warehouse a little faster well and what you know one thing you know coming from the, the taxidermy standpoint you know i i've i'm blessed to have a number of my you know the people around here my students that i do taxidermy work for that i you know that i teach in school and and uh so i, I get to see a lot of deer but i get to see a lot of deer that the the people can tell me history on it, right? Like where they live, if they're in the hills, river bottom, what they feed them, what they eat, et cetera. And so, you know, that was also kind of part of my research, which was crazy is, you know, deer that, and, and I actually just did a short piece on Instagram and Facebook here just last weekend about this in my shop. I held up, you know, I had three different sets of antlers. I had a two and a half year old buck that I i am holding at first that, it's a it's a nice two and a half year old deer, but the the antlers feel like porous and almost gritty, sharp, and they're lightweight. And you know he's a former student of mine, uh, and the deer is you know fed strictly you know protein. I mean they 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 pour the protein to these deer. Uh, then I have another deer that's uh, it's a five and a half is what I aged him at. He's a nice uh, you know nice mature buck. And he starts off kind of solid on his base and frames, but as you move up to the tips, it starts to get porous again, and he's holding velvet. And then I hold up another rack that's solid, and it's only a two-and-a-half-year-old deer, but it's a nice, solid-feeling rack. And the, and the big difference are that I know about these deer's history, these bucks, is the deer, deer that are only fed protein... And that's one of the battles that we fight with re-educating the public, is everybody's like, oh, what kind of protein is it? You know, or... You know, I can just get straight, I can get protein that's a little bit cheaper. Well, 
you can buy straight protein cheaper, true, but pro, it, it, it kind of works like this. Protein is the antler matrix. Uh, some part of the deer, the, the antler growth cycle, it can be anywhere from 30 to 40 some percent protein. Um, and a hardened antler, sometimes in the growth stage, it may get up to 70, 80 percent protein at a certain time, uh, but ends up being around that 30 some to 40 some percent protein. But that protein acts like a, a, a scaffolding, a matrix. So it'd be like if you put uh, your wooden laths on your wall, that's like the protein matrix. Uh, and then your minerals have to come along later and they get deposited. They take it off of their skeleton that was stored there over the winter months. They take it off of their skeleton and essentially uh, cement those wooden laths. And then it ends up being, you know, around 40-ish percent uh, uh, minerals. Uh, there's about 11 different minerals that go into antlers approximately. And so, in essence, what you're doing is you're growing this great matrix, and you might be growing what looks like this big rack, uh, but in essence, it's weak. And so you end up with a lot of broke-off tines. And some of you out there are going, well, that makes sense now. You, everything's got to be balanced. you got to have the right minerals and nutrients and vitamins to complement that protein and make a complete solid rack. Now, is this going to prevent tines from breaking? Well, no. I mean, you get a couple bucks fighting pretty hard and, you know, it's not a foolproof there, but it's, everything's got to be there. It's, it's just like anything too much of certain things is not a good thing. And so, uh, you know, I've got the, you know, I'm fortunate that every year I see tons of racks and I get to study them and find out their background and what they ate and, and really see the proof that certain feeding programs, especially if they're just really one-sided, are are actually doing more harm than good. And that's kind of an indicator. If you if you notice bucks in the in the during hunting season that still have pieces of you know still have a little bit of have a number of like velvet attached to it, that tells you that that deer's antlers weren't done growing yet. But the body said, hey dude, we can't spare any more mineral. Our bones are going to start breaking, so you're done. You've grown, and this is where it is, because those minerals get put on that skeleton. In February, March, and April, they get stored. And then once they're turned into deer mineral and stored, you know, on the deer's body, then come spring, they begin to get pulled back off of the skeleton to start uh, forming from the antler pedicle and, and producing that antler. And so that's kind of kind of cool to see that come full circle from a you know a hunter standpoint and from a taxidermy standpoint and a science standpoint. And it, you can, I don't know. My wife says I got too many squirrels running up in my head, and sometimes I do. I just I, <laughs> too too many directions. No, 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 no. And I was I was just looking at the counter. I'm going. We got to knock this off. But you know you're you know I could take a five you know five credit course from you, and I think I might learn a little bit. I'm being facetious. Uh, well said. We're at the time, guys. We gotta we gotta wrap this up, and um, we'll talk. You know, after we wrap up, but um, give some shout outs, and then we gotta we gotta call it a show. Well, we want to make a shout out to first our families and uh, uh, my wife Lindy and Jason's wife Christy for putting up with us, our kids, and make us motivated to do what we do. And then we'd also like to do a shout out to all of our current dealers and future dealers that have trusted us and come on board with us and knowing our product. We think highly of all those guys and that, um, and we'd like to do a, a, a shout out to the hunting community and, and people like you that um, are willing to listen to us and uh, help us in our, in our venture. Yeah, that pretty much sums it up. I just, it's just a blessing to be able to do what we do. So obviously I got to thank the good Lord for that. Cause that's, uh, you know, a lot of doors have been, uh, opened for me that I, I didn't necessarily seek out. And so it's kind of, uh, it definitely is a blessing not only to be doing this, but to be working with Eric and, and, you know, and having the experiences we are. And like he said, uh, you know, our family being uh, as understanding as they are, because, you know, sometimes we spend a lot of time on the phone when we should be probably hanging out with them and the and the kiddos and, and stuff. So, yeah, that kind of sums it up for, for me anyways. 
Well, Jason Obermiller and Eric Fitzgerald, thank you on behalf of thousands of listeners across North America. Um, folks, if you listen to the show, you're going to learn something. If you choose to apply it, that's your choice. But um, you can't say that by listening to Whitetail Rendezvous, you're not getting some of the best of the best information available out there on um, what it takes to have um, a great deer herd. And so on behalf of our listeners, um, Jason and Eric, thank you so much for being guests on Whitetail Rendezvous. Thank you. Hey, folks, we got a new sponsor. It's called Buckwild Coffee. What's so special about Buckwild Coffee? Well, a gazillion people go to Starbucks every day and drink coffee. Well, why shouldn't Buckwild Coffee offer you light, medium, or dark roast with free shipping? All you have to do is go to whitetailrendezvous.com, go to shop, and order your coffee, and I'll ship it out for free. Hey, thanks so much for visiting Buckwild Coffee. The best brew in the West, the best brew around the campfire, the best brew in the hunting shack, the best brew anywhere. Buckwild Coffee. Get yours today. Hey, folks, the next episode's going to be a lot of fun. We're going to meet with Bill Anderson. Shoot to thrill outdoors. What does that mean? They just love the outdoors. He and his crew hail out of Missouri. And, folks, they just love to get out and mix it up with all sorts of ducks and geese and turkeys and whitetails. It's going to be a really interesting show. Thanks for joining us. Be sure to tune in tomorrow for another episode of Whitetail Rendezvous, where you can listen and learn from the experts so you can be more successful on your next hunt. Until next time, listen, learn, and succeed.